Hello, Philosophy 102. All right. Uh, we are on Chapter 5, uh, Rhetoric, the Art of Persuasion. Uh, those of you who have taken English courses uh, are probably familiar with what rhetoric is. Uh, in philosophy class, we talk about it a bit differently. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to set aside um, what you know from your English classes and uh, come at this with a fresh view. Um, mostly we're going to focus on identifying uh, different rhetorical devices. Uh, these are euphemisms, dysphemisms, what our textbook is calling weaselers uh, and downplayers, as well as stereotypes, innuendo, loaded questions, ridicule, sarcasm, hyperbole, um, and we're going to talk quite a lot about rhetorical definitions. Um, as well as proof surrogates, which I believe I've mentioned before. Uh, very exciting stuff. So let's move through this fairly quickly. Uh, the recap section in your textbook is going to be extremely useful. Uh, it is for this chapter. It is extremely concise. I, I think it's great. Um, you might do just as well to study it as well as your notes from this section. So let's get started. So I think the most important place to start is what are we talking about when we're talking about rhetoric? Um, I like the textbook here. Um, it's, it's considered, rhetoric is, uh, I, they, they call it a uh, twin uh, anchor of Western education right here. Uh, I think of it as an evil twin, uh, and we'll talk about why. Uh, you use rhetoric to win someone to your point of view. You use logic to demonstrate a claim or support it. These are separate enterprises. You can use logic to persuade people, but all too often they are persuaded by poor logic and unmoved by good logic. This is why education increasingly emphasizes critical thinking, to help people improve their logic and help them distinguish between proof and persuasion. I don't know about you guys, but when... I form a belief, uh, I want to know that I have done so based on good evidence or good reasoning, uh, not because somebody has emotionally appealed to me or attempted to manipulate me or used rhetoric. Um, none of this is to say rhetoric is bad. So before we launch right into this, there's one more note I want to highlight from the textbook. So I'm not trying to... Uh, make any enemies in the English department. So I really want to make clear that there's nothing wrong with someone trying to make his or her case as persuasive as possible. Good writers use well-chosen, rhetorically effective words and phrases. But we as critical thinkers must be able to distinguish the argument, if there is one, <laughs> contained in a passage from the rhetoric. Right? We want to be able to tell uh, what the actual evidence is and the strength of the argument and not be persuaded entirely by uh, emotional appeals or other sorts of appeals. We must distinguish between the logical force of a set of remarks and its psychological force. You won't find much rhetoric of the sort we discuss here in science journals because it carries no probative weight. Scientists may hope readers accept their findings, but it's risky for them to try to sell their findings by couching them in the language of persuasion. That's not, it's not that rhetoric weakens an argument, it's just that it doesn't strengthen it. And this is kind of what I really want you to uh, hold in your mind as we move through this. Good rhetoric is fine, it's great. Uh, I have been known to write the occasional piece of short fiction, and if I didn't consider the weight my stories have and the weight of the words and what's going to get a better emotional response from my readers uh, versus, you know, just the purely logical, um, I wouldn't be a very good writer. Uh, it is perfectly fine uh, to use rhetoric. Just don't mistake it for an actual argument. Uh, the first rhetorical device we're going to look at is a euphemism. This is usually my favorite class to teach in person because uh, I love listing euphemisms. These are hilarious. Um, 
You might think you don't know what a euphemism is, uh, but chances are you have employed use of euphemisms uh, very recently. They're very common in our language, um, in the English language. So a euphemism, by definition, is a neutral or positive expression used in place of one that carries negative associations. So probably the most obvious of these is um, I am going to the restroom. Uh, what, what is what is a restroom? It's why does my font do that? Um, it's it's a toilet. It's the toilet room. <laughs> like if we were being completely uh, descriptively accurate, we would say I need to go to the toilet room. <laughs> uh, but toilet uh, and the activities that go on in that room. Uh, maybe have some negative associations. So instead, we replace the toilet room, uh, or the bathroom, in rooms where there aren't even baths, right? A uh, public restroom or bathroom is called a bathroom, in spite of the fact that there is no bath in any of those, I hope. Um, so be because bath and rest are neutral or positive expressions, right? Um, so this is just a really obvious, very common euphemism, a neutral or a positive expression used in place of one that carries negative associations. Now that I've pointed that out to you, you can probably think of tons of them. Um, we, we might say of a patient, um, she passed away, right? Um, we're passed away takes the place of died. Uh, it's a bit gentler, um, gone to a better place, moved on. Um, there are some less tasteful than others. Um, pushing up daisies <laughs> um, is arguably a euphemism. Uh, there are also really popular ones uh, with regard to coitus. Um, you guys uh, will be familiar with I typed that incorrectly. Netflix and chill. Uh, I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, Netflix and chill is a euphemism. Uh, we all know what it means. Uh, if you don't know what it means, Google it. Don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> I've had students ask me before, and I feel like Google is your friend here. Um, it's a euphemism. Uh, we don't want to say what it actually is. Well, it's coitus, it's sex, right? This is a sexual overture um, or an offer of sex. And there are some negative associations that we have socially with that. It's not something we talk about in polite company. Uh, we might perceive it as being inappropriate. So instead of offering sex, uh, we offer Netflix and chill. <laughs> So this is a personal favorite of mine uh, because it's so funny. <laughs> um, I just find it hilarious. I don't know if you guys do. Um, you may be thinking of some now. I love getting emails uh, with euphemisms that I've not heard before. Um, and obviously, I don't mind if they're a bit racy. Uh, but th these exist in our language. They're very common. Don't be threatened by this fancy name for them. You know what they are, and you recognize them when you see them as a native English speaker. If I have any non-native English speakers, uh, most languages uh, have this phenomenon uh, of replacing a word with that has negative associations with a word that has a positive association or a neutral association. So how does this relate back to critical thinking? Uh, how can this influence our thinking? It's not as though anybody is actually confused about where you're going when you say the restroom, uh, or about what's happened when somebody is said to have passed away, or what somebody is offering if they are offering Netflix and chill. Uh, we, we, we understand that's part of the function of euphemisms like these that you're familiar with. Well, the textbook highlights 
uh, some more salient examples. Detainee means what most of us would call a prisoner, but it seems more benign. At first glance, waterboarding might sound like something you'd expect to see young people doing on a California beach, not a torture technique. Likewise, uh, collateral damage is a sanitized way of saying civilian casualties. Uh, so when we come across these more uh, prescient sorts of euphemisms, uh, it does sanitize. I quite like that word. It, it sanitizes. It, uh, it almost pulls the emotional force of calling someone a prisoner out of it. It might make their situation seem less bad, um, less pressing. Right? They've been, they've merely been detained. So this, this can influence our thinking quite a lot. Uh, and you'll notice it shouldn't influence our thinking because no argument has been given. Um, euphemisms obviously can be used to whitewash wrongdoing, but they have positive uses as well. It would be insensitive to tell friends that you were sorry they killed their dog. <laughs> Instead, you say you're sorry to hear they had to put their dog to sleep. Uh, again, rhetoric is okay. We just don't want to use it in place of an argument. Moving along, um, we have the dysphemism. A uh, dysphemism is just the opposite of a euphemism. So, whereas a euphemism is replaces uh, a negative association with a neutral or positive expression, a dysphemism is going to replace something positive or neutral uh, with a negative word or with a phrase that has a negative association. So. Let's just get this down. Used to produce a negative effect on someone's attitude about something or tone down the positive associations it may have. I think this was just the elaborate way of saying the opposite of a euphemism. But if it helps, we can put that in our notes. Um, and these are uh, come to mind uh, a bit less easily, but, um, you know, we might say... Um, she's a nut job, right? That's not very polite. I am not condoning the use of uh, this dysphemism. Um, that's not flattering, rather than saying, you know, um, she has uh, mental health concerns or something along that line. Uh, sometimes we'll find dysphemisms are used in place of euphemisms, as some of you might have thought I did just there. Uh, what's obvious is that it is th there is a much more neutral way to state something like this. I'm going to take a risk of uh, offending some of you. Uh, I wonder if I have any vegetarians uh, among my student body. Uh, <laughs> if if I do, don't don't get upset too early. Um, most of you may have heard from uh, vegetarian and vegan communities or animal rights activists or environmentalists um, something like animal flesh um, used in place of meat. Um, so uh, you might hear somebody say, or, or for example, among vegetarians, uh, the claim that uh, it's a corpse or a carcass. Um, these are words with negative associations uh, used to replace the word meat. Um, it's commonly used. If you are a vegetarian, please don't do that. Um, I am also a vegetarian. I have been a vegetarian for 30 years. Um, I'm very dedicated to it, uh, but I'm also dedicated to using good argumentation and logic to support the decisions that I hope to influence other people with. Um, I believe people don't need to be persuaded by gross-sounding words. Uh, this is a bad tactic. It's a bad tactic that a group that I am a part of engages in pretty routinely. Um, 
And I think this is just a really great example of why rhetoric of this sort is a bad idea. Because those of you who are not vegetarian or vegan will recognize what happens when somebody uses this rhetoric. It's insulting and it just inflames tempers and turns what could be a really interesting discussion into a, um, well, a hot mess, to be honest, um, but into a gross-out fight um, or into a battle of rhetoric, which we really want to avoid. Let's move on to some of the salient examples available in the textbook. You'll see. Um, they, they actually use this one here, eating animal flesh sounds worse than eating meat. The tax imposed on inheritance is sometimes called a death tax, which leaves a bad taste because it suggests that the deceased, rather than the inheritors, are being taxed. Um, this is less common now, but in the early 2000s, people wouldn't stop talking about the death tax. Uh, <laughs> as if you're being taxed for dying, right? Uh, dismissing a legislative proposal as a scheme also qualifies as a dysphemism. It would be hard for us to explain the difference between conservative and far-right or between liberal and ultra-liberal, but the second of each of these pair, pairs, I'm sorry, that is terrible reading, the second of each of these pairs sounds worse than the first, and they both qualify as dysphemisms. So I, I've noticed this a lot in contemporary politics. Um, we talk about the side that we are not on in terms of them being radical, um, right? far right or ultra liberal or radical liberal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, when in actual actuality, the most of uh, our elected officials are fairly moderate. Um, these are not accurate depictions. They're attempts to bias you um, through rhetoric, just through using ugly sounding words. Wingnut qualifies as a dysphemism for either end of the political spectrum, although you guys might not be familiar with this one. It's a bit dated. Um, <laughs> They have a couple other ones in here, but I think this gives you a general gist of what a dysphemism is. If you're struggling to keep these the dysphemism and euphemism separate, it might be helpful to remember, and this is quite silly, maybe I shouldn't put it down here, um, it's a dis, as in like an insult, I, uh, I don't know if you guys like this. I, I love um, rap diss tracks. Um, <laughs> I think they're really funny. <laughs> um, uh, so when I say diss, I mean, like, I guess actually the apostrophe would go right here. Um, so it's, why did I type and? Um, it's a diss or an insult, and you can remember dysphemism starts with a D, so this is the one that is insulting or negative, makes negative, right? Whereas a euphemism, uh, you can think of maybe euphoria um, or something like that. I don't know if that's actually helpful because euphoria is kind of an uncommon word, but uh, those help keep these straight because just like with uh, subjective, objective, inductive, and deductive, you know, or a lot of the vocabulary we've learned in this class, um, it's not important to your critical thinking that you know the names of these things, but it is important for our discussions and for your exams that you be able to correctly identify um, what work each of these are doing, and they're very easy to get switched backwards. So hopefully that uh, mnemonic helps you keep those things separate. Just remember a dysphemism is a dis or an insult. Moving along, our next rhetorical device is the weaseler. Uh, this is a kind of silly word. I don't know what weasels ever did to anyone to get such a bad rep. Um, but a weaseler, where are we, um, is inserted into a claim to help protect it from criticism. So I'm trying to think how to, I mean, I should just copy and paste this. Um, 
there we go. I do think all of this is important to your definition. Um, yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, insert it into a claim to protect it from criticism by watering it down somewhat, weakening it, and giving the claim's author a way out in case the claim is challenged. Now, some of you might have seen some of the ones in the textbook, and I don't feel the need to um, draw on our imagination because I think these are recognizable as soon as you see them. Um, so when you hear uh, the words up to inserted into a claim, uh, it gives the speaker uh, or the author's claim, the claim's author, um, a way out right so let's look at how this operates up to five miles more per gallon what does this mean up to 20 more yards off the tee that one I'm not a golf person I don't really understand so understand that one I enjoyed this one uh, lose up to 10 pounds a week does that mean that you will lose 10 pounds a week if you know this new diet claims that you can lose up to 10 pounds a week. No, we recognize that what this means is that at most what you're going to lose is 10 pounds a week, um, which I think would be really unhealthy, actually. I'm not positive, but um, anyway. Uh, in fact, it doesn't guarantee any weight loss at all. Right? If we took the up to out of this, lose 10 pounds a week, that's a big claim. So the marketers behind this want to leave you with this claim in your mind, lose 10 pounds a week, but uh, fortunately we have uh, consumer protections in this country, so, oh no, so they have to add this up to, so that they're not guaranteeing something and then failing to deliver on it. Um, now, just by adding this, they get to say, lose 10 pounds a week, hoping that that's what sticks with you uh, and not actually technically be lying to you because they've just said you could lose up to 10 pounds a week. Uh, hopefully that makes sense to y'all. It's pretty insidious. I don't like it. Um, we've all seen when we're shopping at stores um, up to 80% off right, on a clearance rack somewhere unless y'all are too fancy to be shopping the clearance racks. Um, and we know that what that means is that at most we might find one item with 10 or 80% off, right? Uh, there may be ones in there that are not discounted at all. It weakens the claim, it waters it down, and it gives the, auth the claim's author a way out in case the claim is challenged. Jumping back to the textbook, uh, let's look at some other examples of this. Uh, so the textbook invites us to make up a statistic. Let's say that 98% of American doctors believe that aspirin is a confusing, <laughs> contributing cause of RISE syndrome in children, and that the other 2% are unconvinced. If we then claim that some doctors are unconvinced that aspirin is related to RISE syndrome, we cannot be held accountable for having said something false, even though our claim might be misleading to some who did not know the complete story. The word some has allowed us to weasel the point. <laughs> uh, remember, a claim does not have to be false in order to be misleading. In fact, I would say the real thrust of a weaseler is that the claims are not flatly false. They're not obviously false. Uh, they're just profoundly misleading. So uh, instead of coming up with lots of examples of this, we're just going to kind of make a list. So words that sometimes weasel, such as perhaps, possibly, maybe, and may be, there is a difference there, uh, among others can be used to produce innuendo, which we'll talk about in a minute, to plant the suggestion without actually making a claim that a person can be held to. So um, here we go. We can suggest that, I have no idea how to say this name, uh, someone is a liar without actually saying so, and thus without saying something that might be hard to defend. And saying that someone may be a liar 
we can say that it is possible that someone is a liar, which is true of us all, after all. Perhaps someone is a liar works nicely, too. All of these are examples of Weaslers used to create innuendo. Uh, this, this is the last really important thing I want to say about Weaslers. Not every use of words and phrases like these is a Weasling one. Right? Um, it's only when it's used to uh, mislead, essentially. It is entirely possible that you use the word maybe completely authentically, as it were, um, or in a, a way that's in no way disingenuous. Uh, this is not a ban on these words. It's alerting you to how these words can be used um, in an attempt to weasel. Moving on to the next one, we have downplayers. Downplayers are kind of easy to confuse uh, with weaslers, so uh, let's make a special effort to keep them separate in our minds. So, uh, downplayers are exactly what they sound like. They uh, downplay the significance of something. Uh, I, I love that uh, my Word document doesn't want these to be words. I promise they are for the purposes of our class. Uh, so downplayers attempt to make someone or something look less important or less significant. So let's just get that in our notes. And again, let's just refer to the textbook for examples because they're quite a bit to type out. Um, so. I, I like this example. Um, don't mind what Mr. Pierce says. He thinks he's an educator. It downplays Mr. Pierce and his statements. What and also, you know, what educator doesn't think that they're an educator? Like, um, it, and what's happening here is he thinks he's an educator is used to downplay. Mr. Pierce. Um, but we kind of need the whole phrase to really understand it. So we can, uh, we can make the same example uh, even more obvious. Uh, don't mind what Mr. Pierce says, he's just another educator. Notice how the phrase just another downplays Mr. Pierce's status still further. Some other downplayers uh, are mere and merely. Um, there's actually some interesting research recently, uh, in the past 10 years or so. Women use the word just uh, far more frequently than men. Uh, and it appears to be an attempt to uh, downplay uh, what might be otherwise seen as uh, an assertive or aggressive statement. So, for example, uh, I might say, this is just a suggestion. Right? Uh, it should be enough that I say something is a suggestion, but we might add the word just to downplay our own statement that something is just a suggestion. Um, or the phrase, I'm just saying, right, um, is an attempt to actually downplay um, our, our own claims. So it doesn't always have to be used in a super derogatory way. Just is a big down player. Next up we have my absolute favorite example, um, the term so-called. Uh, this is a really common down player uh, and I, I actually have a great example of this. Uh, I listened to AM talk radio. Uh, I did a lot more of it uh, before the lockdown. Uh, I usually listen to it when I'm driving and I was driving to the university one morning, and this was around the time when there was an investigation into possible Russian collusion uh, between Donald Trump and, well, Russia, or Donald Trump's administration or campaign uh, and Russia. So there had been a phone call between Donald Trump and uh, I believe it was someone in Ukraine. I, I forget the exact details, but uh, 
a press spokesperson for Donald Trump uh, was doing a radio interview on AM Talk Radio, and she referred to this phone call, which definitely occurred, just to be very clear. Uh, there was never any debate as to whether or not a phone call took place. Uh, the thing at issue was the contents of the phone call. Uh, but this woman uh, referred to it as a, and I feel the need to type this out, um, so-called phone call. And I will, I will never forget that. Um, because what else would you call it? I mean, she was, she was doing her job. Um, she obviously uh, works with the media, and uh, part of her job is to provide explanations that favor her employer. So I, I don't mean to say she was doing a bad job. Uh, in fact, she was arguably doing a very good job if you don't understand what down players are. Uh, but so-called phone call, why did she add that in there? Why didn't she say, during the phone call, Donald Trump uh, in no way colluded, or something to that effect. No, uh, so-called phone call. It calls into question the veracity of the phone call itself, uh, without ever actually doing so. This is particularly sneaky, and I think it's also just a very funny sentence, uh, because again, what else would we call a phone conversation other than a phone call? <laughs> If you are uh, making a list or including these things in your notes, uh, you're going to want to highlight the so-called bit of this example. And I think that's everything. Let's go back to the textbook. Very briefly, um, you may have been told not to use quotation marks around things that are not quotations in your English class. Uh, that is because this is a rhetorical use of quotation marks uh, in an attempt to downplay something. So I like this example. She got her degree from a correspondence school. I did a bit of a dirty read on that. Like that's clearly how degree, right? You can almost hear the eye roll. Um, that's what these quotation marks are meant to do. Now, I have long called this abuse of punctuation. Uh, this is not the job of quotation marks. Uh, and back when I used to teach English, I was asked, well, what am I supposed to do here if I can't have these scare quotes, uh, which is what they're popularly referred to as, um, if, if I want to say that it's not legitimate? Well, the answer is you explain that you don't believe it is a legitimate degree. You don't abuse punctuation uh, in an attempt to downplay it. You provide an argument for why you do not think that is a legitimate degree in this case. Uh, so let's move on. Um, this one is a bit different, right? John borrowed Hank's umbrella, and Hank hasn't seen it since. Obviously, the scare quotes here uh, are uh, indicating irony. Uh, they're not downplaying it, although they are attempting still to call into question that that is what happened. And I would say this is also inappropriate use of punctuation. Uh, last but not least, many conjunctions, such as nevertheless, however, still, and but, can be used to downplay claims that precede them. And still others, like although, even, and even though, can downplay the claims that follow them. So that's really dense. Uh, let's just look at this example here. So if we look at the sentence, the leak at the plant was terrible, but the plant provided good jobs to thousands of people. We can see that the but here serves to downplay the terribleness of the leak at the plant. Conversely, the word although operates as a downplayer in the opposite way. Although the plant provided good jobs to thousands of people, the leak there was terrible. So both of these serve to downplay um, their respective aspects. I hope that wasn't just even more dense. I won't ask you to uh, like list 
all the downplaying words, but I might ask you to be able to recognize what is being downplayed. So again, the first statement downplays the leak, and the second statement downplays the good the plant produces. I believe we're ready to move on. So we've entered rhetorical devices part two. Uh, the rhetorical devices in this section are considered slanting devices, and well, I guess they're all of them have been slanting devices so far, but these rely on unwarranted assumptions. So this is something we're going to see come up again and again in this class, is unwarranted assumptions leading our thinking awry. So uh, the first one's a stereotype. Nothing fancy about this. Uh, nothing good about this either. <laughs> Unlike some of the other bits of rhetoric here, we, uh, we generally want to stay away from this one for obvious reasons. So... Um, Stereotype is just exactly what it is in all your other exposure, exposures to it and classes and such. It's a cultural belief or idea about a social group's attributes, and it's usually simplified or exaggerated. Um, it is worth noting it can be positive or negative. So let's just get this in our notes if you feel the need to define the stereotype. Um, it might be good to have it uh, clearly defined uh, so you don't confuse it with any of the other ones. Okay, so um, you guys have to promise to not to laugh as we go over this because I have had uh, students laugh about this before, but uh, Americans are sometimes stereotyped as friendly and generous, other times as boorish and insensitive. Um, the laughter usually comes from the idea that Americans are ever stereotyped as friendly and generous. I can tell you, having traveled abroad, uh, certain behaviors, uh, like the fact that we are much more likely than other uh, diaspora to just go out and strike up a conversation, um, is what they're referring to when they say friendly. I, I think the generosity stereotype might come from the uniquely American habit of tipping, uh, I'm really not sure. Um, boorish and insensitive, I don't feel like I need to explain. Either way, the point is these are stereotypes and they're not going to work. Um, if your inclination is to laugh at these things, it's because you know that they don't work, that they are not accurate, that there's no way to come to a reliable conclusion about, in this example, Americans and their dispositions. I don't think uh, we're unaware of what stereotypes are, and for obvious reasons, I don't want to make a whole list of stereotypes for your notes. Uh, so I'm just going to say the problem with stereotypes is that they're unreliable characterizations of people, and when speakers or writers use them to try to win us to the, our, their point of view, we must be on guard. Why must be, we be on guard? Well, because they're unreliable, and we don't want are thinking to be based on unreliable information. The last thing I want to say about stereotypes is um, not actually in favor of the particular bit of research that this textbook highlights, um, but a meta-study that confirms this one bit of it. The mere knowledge of a stereotype can influence our behavior. Um, so the research I am aware of uh, was conducted when people were reminded that stereotypes are not uh, useful or uh, good reasoning. So specifically, uh, a group of grade school age girls were reminded that even though girls are not supposed to be good at math or are not typically, stereotypically, uh, good at math, that was no reason to think that they could not be good at math. The girls were reminded that this was a stereotype and that it was not based in reality. They were then given a math test, and they performed far worse than the girls who were given no such pep talk. And again, uh, they were not told that the stereotype was true. In fact, they were told quite the opposite. Um, that the stereotype was not true, but it seemed as though even being reminded of the stereotype uh, changed the outcome 
of their capacity with regard to math. So this is why I don't dwell on the stereotypes section. I don't want to be uh, producing stereotypes that maybe you guys weren't aware of and doing something awful. Uh, these really influence our behavior more than we might like to think or admit. So be aware that uh, when we have studied them, they, uh, they, they seem pretty insidious. They're pretty sneaky. They're hard to get away from, even if you're saying that they're nonsense uh, or baseless. That alone appears to be enough to influence behavior. Moving on, innuendo. Uh, chances are you know what innuendo is. Uh, it comes up in pop culture predominantly um, in a flirty capacity, uh, but innuendo exists well beyond that. So uh, it's, you know what it is, it's hinting or suggesting at something without actually saying it. Um, it uses the power of suggestion to disparage someone or something. That's how we're defining it for this class. It doesn't always have to disparage. Obviously, we use it more broadly than that in our common vocabulary. Um, but for our purposes, it's about this disparagement. Uh, I think it can be used for other purposes as well. Um, and quite commonly is. But let's get some example. So again, I am going to uh, break from the textbook um, with the idea that uh, it insinuates something derogatory all the time. So, But our examples will have that tone to them. So I, I quite like this one. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proof that at least one candidate in this race doesn't make stuff up. Believe it or not, this is not a quote from our current political situation. Uh, this is completely fictitious. Um, what's the innuendo here? Uh, it, it's never actually said, but it should be pretty apparent to you reading this that uh, the suggestion is that all the other candidates are liars. This is problematic because this person never actually has, the speaker here never actually has to make the claim uh, or defend the claim that the other candidates are liars um, because they have not said it. Uh, therefore, they don't need to defend it. Uh, they have merely insinuated it. Um, so, innuendo. Let's look at their other examples. So, um, we have a conversation here. Jim says, is Ralph telling the truth? To which Joe says, yes, this time. <laughs> and, uh, and this innuendo is pretty apparent. Joe is insinuating that Ralph doesn't usually tell the truth. Um, this is a very, very funny remark. Um, I didn't say the meat was tough. I said I didn't see the horse that is usually outside. Uh, so to unpack this a little bit, uh, the innuendo here is that they have eaten the horse, uh, and that's why the meat is tough. Kind of graphic there. Um, and then here we have probably the manner in which in our own lives we most frequently encounter innuendo. Uh, she's just an aerobics instructor. At least that's what he tells his wife. And, uh, we, we haven't said uh, that... Uh, the, the clear implication that he is having an affair with his aerobics instructor. Um, but we can tell that that suggestion's in there. So, innuendo. Um, we're not going to talk about significant mention very much. I want to move directly on to loaded questions. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys a heads up, those of you who have watched this far in the video. Uh, I might try to trick you. You can't assume that anything with a question mark on the end is inherently a loaded question. Um, so watch out for that. I, I might might be a little tricky here. 
um, what is a loaded question? I think we can look at this word and uh, kind of see what's going on with or at, at this phrase and see what's going on with it. A loaded question is going to be a question, but what is it loaded with? Well, it's loaded with an unwarranted assumption. So, a loaded question, like innuendo, implies something without coming out and saying it. For example, the question, why does the president hate rich people, implies, without quite saying it, that the president hates rich people. Right? Um, so it is a question, but what is it loaded with? Um, I, I prefer this explanation down here. So let's, let's look at how this works. Every question rests on assumptions. Even an innocent question like, what time is it, depends on the assumption that the hearer speaks English and probably has a means of finding out the time, you know, a watch or a phone or something. Right? Uh, these are warranted assumptions. These are, well, generally, like assuming you are in a predominantly English-speaking country um, and people routinely and figure out what time it is. So those are warranted assumptions. We have every reason to assume that that's the case. A loaded question, however, rests on one or more unwarranted assumption. So this is what I want us to keep in our notes. So, and it's not just that they're unwarranted, it's, it, it goes a bit further than that. Uh, so I am going to give us an example of a loaded question because what's happening with it becomes immediately apparent uh, once you look at it. So, I did not make this up. Uh, this is the quintessential uh, philosophy example of a loaded question. Have you stopped beating your wife? Um, what is this loaded with? So the interesting trick here is, uh, let's say I, let's say Tom says this. Have you stopped beating your wife? Um, let's let's be inclusive. Um, Lucy, have you stopped? beating your wife. And Lucy says, yes. <laughs> um, what's packed into this yes? Well, that she beat her wife, right? Um, what if Lucy says no? <laughs> what's packed into that? Well, that she beats her wife. Um, this, there, there's no way out. It creates this trap where if Lucy were to answer this question, be it yes or no, if she were to respond to the question as asked, uh, she would end up committing herself to this unwarranted assumption, to this proposition that she beat her wife in the first place. So loaded questions aren't about the actual question that's been asked. It's about the sneaky kind of innuendo-esque uh, implication that is loaded into the question and they're nearly impossible to answer. They're not genuine questions. They've done their work uh, merely by implying something that they wanted to imply. If any of you guys enjoy like legal dramas, uh, you might recognize that uh, in dramatizations uh, quite often lawyers <laughs> will ask absolutely ridiculous questions like this uh, because th they're not trying to get uh, the person being questioned to answer in a way that satisfies uh, the question itself. They're trying to imply to everybody around that this person, in this case, beats their wife. Let's go back to the textbook. I believe they have some good examples. As it turns out, I was mistaken. <laughs> um, the only other example in here is uh, how did Melanie acquire such a wonderful voice? Obviously, this is loaded with the assumption that Melanie has a wonderful voice. Um, 
that issue, if it were an issue, has still to be resolved. Um, we'll see loaded questions come up repeatedly in class, uh, but again, keep in mind this is the real mechanism of action with regard to loaded questions. It's not about, oh, here's another example, in case you didn't want to write that other one in your notes. Um, have you always loved being in debt? <laughs> Um, it implies without qu quite saying it that you love being in debt. Um, so uh, it's about that implication, not about the question. That's what we want to keep in mind with these. Let's move on. Very briefly, um, and this doesn't need to go in your notes. Uh, you will not be tested on this. But I've been seeing a lot of it recently, so maybe I'll think of some extra credit or something we can do with it. Um, I want to talk about ridicule or sarcasm, which is also sometimes known as the horse laugh. Uh, so this is best articulated, I think, just with an example. Like if somebody said, send aid to Egypt, ha ha ha, right? Uh, I don't need to say more than that. It's, it's clear that I'm implying that sending aid to Egypt is ridiculous. I see this so much in politics, uh, on social media. The laugh react on Facebook is used more frequently maliciously, I think, uh, than because something genuinely has caused laughter. Uh, what's important to keep in mind here, and what the, the reason I wanted to mention this, is that you know the next time you watch a debate, remember that that the person who has the funniest lines and who gets the most laughs may be the person who seems to win the debate, but no point has actually been made here. No argument has been given. So this might just be me, but I find humor very persuasive. Uh, and I have to be on guard for falling victim to this particular rhetorical device. If somebody is just being hilarious, um, even if it's in ridiculing someone else, uh, I, I need to keep in mind, and we all need to keep in mind, that they've not actually made any good points. They have not presented us with an argument. Um, they have made jokes. And hopefully our minds aren't changed and our opinions are not influenced um, by somebody's capacity to, you know, get a lot of laughs or ridicule someone or make jokes at their opponent's expense. So with that said, let's move on to stuff that you will be tested on. Um, hyperbole. Again, uh, this term is common in English classes or literature classes. Uh, some people just consider it a literary device. We are considering it as a rhetorical device, and all it is is exaggeration. Um, an extravagant overstatement or exaggeration, if you want to be really wordy about it. Um, again, this is just rhetoric, no argument is given. Um, so, for example, the Democrats want everyone to be on welfare is hyperbole. Realistically, no, they don't. Nobody wants everyone to be on welfare. Um, not even people who support universal basic income want everyone to be on welfare. <laughs> Uh, likewise, so is nobody in the Tea Party likes African Americans. I, I don't know if you guys are aware of the Tea Party. It was a political movement um, shortly after Obama's first term um, that kind of came and went relatively quickly, um, but they were conservative. Uh, so you could say nobody in the Republican Party likes African Americans, and that would still be hyperbolic. Uh, describing your parents as fascists because they don't want you to major in art also counts as hyperbole, right? Um, and exaggeration is normal. We all exaggerate, and that is not an exaggeration, uh, not only to express how strongly we feel about something, but also sometimes to persuade our listeners of a lesser claim. So 
Uh, I do hear these in politics a fair bit. Uh, I'm mentioning this because I will present you with a piece of extra credit uh, at the end of this lecture, and I will try to remind you of it as frequently as possible, but this is when it becomes really relevant. Um, sorry, I just let my eyes fall on this, and I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. Um, so what's important to keep in mind is it's just rhetoric. These are not arguments, uh, and our positions should not be swayed because of it. Uh, I don't really feel the need to give any examples of hyperbole, but if you're still struggling with the idea, you can always send me a message and uh, let me know. So our next section is on rhetorical definitions. Uh, these are, in my estimation, the most important part of this section. So they're actually mentioned earlier in the textbook, so not theatrical <laughs> or theoretical. Um, rhetorical definitions. Um, so we're in a section of the chat of the textbook about rhetoric. Uh, this is where some of the discussion of rhetorical definitions takes place, but uh, I find an earlier discussion of it very useful. So if you want to follow along, you can see that it's in chapter three. So we're going to pause briefly and go back to chapter three, and then we'll come back here. So we're on page 133 of the PDF and page 76 of the physical book, although I have no idea how you've printed it out, so maybe that's not accurate if you have printed it out. Uh, but 133, this is in chapter 3, um, is this brief entry on the purpose of definitions. So lexical definitions are definitions like those we find in dictionaries. They tell us what a word ordinarily means. Um, so, you know, they've got a definition of this specific kind of American monkey uh, of the marmoset family. Uh, so, no, this is not what, this is where brains typically go. Uh, you might ask, isn't this what all definitions do? Uh, but no, they do not. There are also precisifying or stipulative definitions, and that's what we engage with or in a lot uh, in philosophy. Uh, they're designed to make a term more precise, less vague or general, or to stipulate a new or different meaning from the ordinary one. So right like this example, uh, the word dollars is too general uh, to be used in its normal sense in an international sales contract because it could apply to US dollars, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, etc. So we'll make the meaning precise by stipulating that in this contract, the term dollars will refer exclusively to Canadian dollars. So uh, sometimes you might hear me say, for the purposes of this class, or you might hear someone say, for the sake of conversation, and then they will provide a definition. That's a stipulative or precisifying definition. So these are all great and good. There is one evil, awful kind of uh, definition that we as good reasoners should never engage with, and that is the persuasive or rhetorical definition. Uh, unsurprisingly, these are used to persuade or slant someone's attitude or point of view toward whatever the defined term refers to. Sounds really complicated, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this kind of definition can be troublesome because it often distorts the real meaning of a term in order to cause the listener or reader to favor or disfavor a person, policy, object, or event. So if a liber liberal friend tries to define a conservative as a hidebound, narrow-minded narrow hypocrite who thinks the point to life is making money and ripping off poor people, we would all agree that is not a good, unbiased, fair definition. In fact, that is a rhetorical definition. Uh, these crop up in all sorts of fallacious thinking. We will continue to revisit rhetorical definitions. Uh, but reading that, you know the point here is not clarification of the meaning of the word conservative. It's a way of trash-talking conservatives. So. 
<clears throat> we do see this come up um, in public policy uh, and politics. So we're going to take a look at that and then we'll get back to chapter five of the textbook. Um, so what they mean by this is the positive or negative association, associations of the word. They ask you to consider a difference that I think is really relevant between government guaranteed health care and a government takeover of health care. So these terms might reasonably be used to refer to the same thing, but they clearly have different emotional associations, one positive and one negative. So they have a different connotation. Our definition of abortion as the murder of an unborn child at the beginning of the section, ah, I skipped that, I didn't mean to miss that, we'll scroll back up to that, I lied, um, is a really popular example. So let's, let's talk about this uh, because I think it is the most common uh, use of rhetorical definitions I come across. So, as I said before I scrolled up and located this, this is something I see in the wild, in life, uh, very often. And it's actually a really interesting uh, philosophic debate. Um, it is true that a multitude of attempts have been made to construct a definition of a person, um, or if you like, human being. Um, human being here, it's worth noting, is not just human, right? Um, what is this being? doing here? Um, well, it's kind of implying something other than just a human, right? Uh, it, I, I would go so far as to say, like, let's just use person. Uh, it might seem silly that a multitude of attempts have been made to try to define a person, because maybe a person in your mind is just a human. Um, it's just that clear. It's anything that is biologically human. But then we don't tend to think of corpses as persons. Um, we don't tend to think of uh, intelligent animals as humans, but we might think of them as persons. We might recognize that they have a certain agency in the world. So this is a really interesting source of discussion in philosophy, um, specifically with regard to ethics. Um, Okay, moving on. Um, thought about saying something, but I won't. Uh, everything from rational animal to featherless biped has been suggested, but such important issues as whether abortion is morally permissible, whether fetuses have rights, whether a fetus is correctly referred to as an unborn child, and doubtless many others, all will turn on how we define person. Right? Um, and some of these other basic concepts in here. So indeed, if we define abortion as the murder of an unborn child, the debate on abortion is over before it even begins. This is very illustrative to me. Um, here is another example um, of the force of rhetorical definitions. Uh, some arguments against the acceptance of gay right gay Gay rights for, I'm sorry, I cannot read this. Some arguments against the acceptance of rights for gay men and lesbians depend on the claim that their orientation is unnatural. But to arrive at a definition of natural or unnatural is no easy task. If you spend a few minutes thinking about this difficulty even better, if you discuss it with others, you probably notice that it is quite difficult to define natural or unnatural. Uh, what is natural, de depends, depending on who is defining the term, can mean anything from what occurs to nature to correct in the eyes of God. Rhetorical definitions cut out the conversation and come to a conclusion uh, without actually providing an argument. Again, the debate is over before it's even begun. So let's jump forward in the textbook again to chapter 5. So here we are back in chapter five, uh, in case you jumped around with me. Uh, this is page 224 of the PDF. So 
here we are, uh, as explained in Chapter 3, rhetorical definitions employ rhetorically charged language to express or elicitate, <laughs> elicit an attitude about something. I need to give my voice a rest. I seem like I can't read very well right now. Okay, so there is our definition for our notes, but again, let's continue this discussion. Um, so again, defining abortion as the murder of an unborn child does this. And in so doing, it stacks the deck against those who think abortion is morally defensible. And again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that no argument has been given. Um, nothing about this should be persuasive. Um, likewise, restricting the meaning of human being to an organism to which a human has given birth stacks the deck the other way, right? So if human being refers only, or person uh, in this sense, uh, referring to the earlier conversation, uh, if person can only mean somebody who has already been born, right, an organism to which a human has already given birth, uh, then it cannot definitionally uh, be murder or wrong or anything like that, right? So it stacks the deck the other way. So I'm wondering if there are other examples in here. I was quite a lot. Um, this tends to cause a lot of conversation, and I want to tell you guys I am completely receptive to that. Um, this is a section I really like teaching because we're generally pretty familiar um, with rhetorical definitions. We've come across them, we've seen them, and uh, maybe we've even been persuaded by some of them. We might have found ourselves making some of them. I know that when I was younger, um, I was... I, I always pointed to things like, that's the dictionary definition of something. Well, clearly it's not that simple if we're having a robust debate about it. Um, but more importantly, no reasons for accepting these things have been given. Um, and therefore, there's no reason to accept the conclusion derived from a uh, rhetorical definition. Um, we're going to move past uh, rhetorical explanations um, and skip all this and just get right down to rhetorical analogies. Um, again, this doesn't need to be in your notes just yet, but it will come up later. Um, so a rhetorical analogy likens, likens two or more things to make them appear better or worse than one another. That's very, very strange. Uh, so let's just talk about a few. So there are the obvious ones, uh, constant likening of Saddam, Saddam Hussein to Adolf Hitler may have influenced some people's attitudes about the Iraq invasion. Um, we, we quite often these days um, see well, here it is. Um, in late 2015 and 2016, we heard Donald Trump compared to Benito Mussolini, um, the fascist dictator of Italy in the early 1940s, and this was an attempt to paint Trump as a fascist. Um, if I have anyone who wants to object now and say, because the conversation has developed a bit um, since this was written, that a lot of people are calling Trump a fascist at this point. Ask yourselves, have they provided an argument for it? Or have you just been given some kind of rhetorical analogy? I'm not saying that these conclusions cannot be true. Um, I'm saying that the rhetorical analogy takes the place of an argument, and we should be skeptical of it because of that. I'm going to keep saying this uh, until uh, you get sick of hearing it. Uh, the purpose of all of this is to alert you to when you are being persuaded by something other than good reasons and facts. Um, so, and, and just to play fair, actually, I, I, I am going to take a moment um, to scroll all the way back up here 
and say, I, I'm not precluding the possibility of a debate between these people. Um, but we need to ask ourselves, um, does merely defining something, defining our side into victory, um, one way or another, actually, should that have any persuasive force? Uh, and does that say the thing we're trying to say? Because it seems to me somebody who uh, wants to make the claim that abortion is the murder of an unborn child, um, or straightforwardly that abortion is murder, um, they're, they're not just trying to make a definition. Uh, somebody who's making this claim is trying to say that abortion is morally wrong. Um, and it doesn't seem like the rhetorical definition or the use of a rhetorical definition gets us very far uh, along that route. It's just a definition. Uh, or maybe it, it, the, the implication is that abortion should be illegal because murder is illegal. Um, but all that somebody who make, makes this claim does is defines themselves into victory. Likewise, um, for somebody who defines person as, or human being, as somebody who has been born, um, okay, they're trying to uh, persuade their audience that abortion is morally permissible. But all they've done is made a definition that we can more or less agree with. Or again, maybe we take them to be saying abortion should be perfectly legal. Um, that's, that's the conclusion they're trying to get to. And it's pretty apparent that uh, just providing a rhetorical definition uh, is very different to providing an argument for that. So hopefully uh, I, I, I'm remaining fair and balanced. <laughs> in all this. Uh, back down to rhetorical analogies. Um, sometimes analogies are used for straightforwardly explanatory purposes. Um, you know, and I like the example of a friend knows nothing about rugby. Rugby, you might promote his understanding by noting its similarity to football. Um, this is not saying all definitions are bad. This is not saying that all analogies are bad. Okay. Let's move on. So on to the part of rhetorical analogies that uh, I think really affects our day-to-day decision-making. Um, we'll notice that advertisers sometimes offer vague comparisons. Uh, now 25% larger. New and improved, right? Quietest by far. It's worth noting that unless both sides of a comparison are made clear, the comparison isn't worth much. Right, 25% um, larger than what? Uh, new and improved uh, from from what? Right, uh, we need the other side of that comparison, which brings us to the next part of the textbook. This list is incredibly valuable. Uh, I have given this to my friends uh, when they have articulated a struggle with. Uh, accepting political or uh, current affairs types type of claims. So it's a series of questions we should be uh, capable of asking ourselves and uh, interrogating data with, be it in a science paper we're reading or an advertisement. So the first one, and this is a little offset, is the comparison vague, right? Uh, which is what we just talked about. Um, what do you mean James is a better swimmer than Ray? In what way is Sarah happier than Santana? What specifically do you have in mind when you assert that women are better equipped to deal with grief? Right? These, these words, better, happier, better again, they make comparisons, uh, but we're not given the other side of the equation or the concept involved uh, is very vague. So. Uh, I, I quite like this. The appropriate questions uh, for comparisons like these is not what makes you think that's true, but rather what do you mean? What do you mean women are better equipped to deal with grief? I, I genuinely do not understand that. Uh, and I would say the same if somebody said that about men. Next, 
is important information missing? It's nice to hear that the unemployment rate has gone down, but not if you learn the reason is that a larger percent of the workforce has given up looking for work. Uh, this is quite sassy, but I like it. Uh, suppose someone says that 90% of heroin addicts once smoked marijuana. Without other information, the comparison is meaningless, since 90% of heroin addicts also, no doubt, ate carrots. Um, so important information is missing uh, when we are presented statistics like this. Uh, this might be surprising to you, or it might not. I think this is a wonderful illustration um, of the way data can be used rhetorically uh, to lie effectively or to mislead. Uh, next is the same standard of comparison being used. Um, so I think the better example is right here. Okay. In 1993, the number of people in the United States with AIDS suddenly increased dramatically. Had, the, had a new form of AID, the AIDS virus developed? No. What actually happened, and this might be super salient to you guys because we're talking about the coronavirus in real time now, uh, and what I mean by that is we're tracking the rate of increase day over day, and a lot of us are paying a good deal of attention to that. Uh, predictions were being made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if suddenly, one day to the next, uh, those numbers skyrocketed, uh, that would be alarming. Uh, but it would not be alarming if we learned something like that the federal government had expanded the definition as they did with AIDS, to include several new indicator conditions. As a result, overnight, 50,000 people were considered to have AIDS who had not so been considered the day before. So we need to make sure the same standard of comparison is being used. If you are following um, the data on COVID-19, uh, I encourage you to check and make sure that your sources are using the same standard of comparison, uh, because otherwise the numbers just are meaningless. Uh, this has been a really interesting thing to watch develop. Uh, I, I don't think, for the record, just full disclosure, I don't think most news outlets uh, are doing this deliberately with regard to our current uh, situation. Okay, are the items comparable? Right. Uh, it's hard to compare professional golfers Jack Nicholas and Ty Tiger Woods since they played against different competitors and had different types of equipment. Right? So we want to make sure that the items are actually comparable. Um, likewise, and something that is a little more salient to me because I don't like sports, uh, it's hard to derive a conclusion from the fact that April's retail business activity is way down compared with last April's if Easter came early this year and the weather was especially cold, right? Uh, the items have become non-comparable. They're disanalogous at that point. Not last but not least, because uh, I think this is quite valuable and something that I've actually heard in my life. Um, if more male drivers than female drivers are involved in traffic fatality, it doesn't need much by itself since male drivers collectively drive more miles than do female drivers, right? So it becomes disanalogous when we consider how much more driving men do on average uh, than women do. So next, is the comparison expressed as an average? Um, this has to do with more applying the data you've received, but let's talk about it. Uh, the average rainfall in Seattle is about the same as that in Kansas City. But you'll spend more time in the rain in Seattle because it rains there twice as often as in Kansas City. Right? Um, it might be alarm alarming to you to find out that the average rainfall in Seattle is about the same as Kansas City. Right? Um, and expressing uh, these comparisons, of course, misses something really crucial, uh, which is it rains twice as often in Seattle, uh, right? So we might be picturing these two places have very similar weather if we find out that the average rainfall is exactly the same. Uh, it, it, 
it's missing relevant information effectively. Uh, the, the comparison uh, is doing work because we've added some assumptions to it in our mind. Uh, another example, we have Central Valley Components, uh, CVC, reports that average salaries of a majority of its employees have more than doubled over the past 10 years. It sounds good, but CVC still may not be a great place to work. Perhaps the increases were due to converting the majority of the employees who worked half-time to full-time and firing the rest. Right? Uh, be very skeptical when you encounter data. Um, understand how to interrogate it. Comparisons that involve average omit details that can be important simply because they involve averages. And this doesn't mean using averages is terrible or fallacious or anything. It's just something we need to be aware of when we are interrogating the data. So here we have our final rhetorical device. There are more in this chapter, uh, but we're just going to end things with proof surrogate. Uh, I may have saved the best for last. Suddenly now it has a color. Um, so proof surrogate, just like loaded question, we can learn a lot about, trying to get rid of this color here. Uh, there we go. Uh, oh, now it's tiny. I'm sorry. OK. Uh, we can learn a lot about proof surrogates just by looking at the words it's composed of. right? Um, some of you may know what a surrogate is. Uh, a surrogate is a replacement, so uh, or uh, an alternative, maybe, is a nicer way to put it. So for example, a substitute teacher is a surrogate teacher. Um, sometimes we hear about surrogate parents, um, where a parent is uh, not accessible for whatever reason, and a child will be placed with surrogate parents. Um, it's, the replacement makes it sound mechanistic, but uh, it's a very easy definition. So uh, surrogate is just a replacement. It is not, it's important to recognize that a surrogate is in no way identical to uh, the original, right? Um, they are different. So when I say replacement, uh, I don't mean like, I had my brakes replaced in my car, right? Uh, because effectively, I'm just getting a new pair of the same brakes. Um, so uh, I think maybe thinking of substitute teachers are probably uh, your best bet with regard to what a surrogate is. Um, so, and then we have proof. So, you know, we might define a substitute teacher as, um, We could say teacher right uh, that would just a teacher surrogate would just be another way of saying a substitute teacher um, so a lot of you have probably become teacher surrogates for your kids uh, during this lockdown right so likewise a proof surrogate uh, the thing that is the surrogate is the proof that is offered Maybe that wasn't the best way to explain it. This one's tricky, uh, so I'm really going to belabor this point. Um, so a proof surrogate suggests there is evidence or authority for a claim without actually citing such evidence or authority. So again, um, we've got this surrogate function, right? It attempts to replace a good citation or evidence um, with the mere suggestion that there is evidence or authority for a claim, right? Uh, there are lots of examples of this. Uh, don't worry if that seems a bit complicated. Okay, so uh, I have a hilarious story about this too. Uh, when someone can't prove or support something, he or she may hint that proof or support is available without being specific as to what it is. Using the phrase informed sources say is a favorite way of making a claim seem more authoritative. Right? Um, and we could add all sorts of funny things on this. Um, 
right? Um, or uh, just for my uh, vegetarian brothers and sisters, uh, right? Um, it it's an attempt to add uh, legitimacy uh, to a claim. It implies that there are informed sources, but then it doesn't provide them. Now, if you find yourself writing a paper or doing research and using the phrase sources say, and then you provide a quote, and then you provide a citation, that is not a proof surrogate. That's just writing in the English language. That is A-OK. -okay. Um, it's only a surrogate when it takes the place of that subsequent citation. Um, so let's look at some other examples. Uh, it's obvious that, right? Uh, uh, so I, people <laughs> do this to me quite frequently. Uh, but let's make this one political. Uh, it's obvious that uh, it's obvious that Trump will win the election. Okay, uh, is it obvious? You might feel it's obvious, um, but you've not given me any reason to feel that way. Uh, so you've offloaded the work of providing some evidence or authority for this claim uh, by just saying it's obvious, right? Uh, let's do another one. So. It's clear to anyone who has thought the matter through carefully. <laughs> and I quite like that they just have this blah in here because that's kind of, that might as well be what, what comes after, right? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, so is it clear? This is very similar to it's obvious that. Uh, but it also implies that if you disagree, so there's some innuendo in here, um, if you disagree, you haven't thought the matter through carefully. Right. Um, oof, that's that's a nasty one. Okay. So thought there were some more uh, studies show is another one. And again, if you find yourself saying studies show, and then you know you go on to make your claim. Um, And then, you know, uh, write your citation and, you know, a date. Um, right? If, if you have this, you're, you're totally fine because you've not replaced your evidence or authority with this phrase. Uh, but if you just gesture off into the ether, studies show uh, and then provide a claim without providing the studies, uh, you are engaging in the rhetorical device of uh, proof surrogate. So, uh, and it is, it's sneaky, it's tricky, I don't like it at all. As we all know is another one. Again, I won't ever ask you to enumerate uh, all the examples I provide. So when you feel like you've got a good idea of what proof surrogate is, um, you're, you're good to go. Or we can just come up with all these fun ones from here. All right? Uh, my favorite one, uh, I, I had a roommate who said this to me. Word on the... <laughs> word on the street is... <laughs> what is word on the street? <laughs> well, it's a proof surrogate. Like, says who? Um... And he had said something awful, like, word on the street is we're going to have to move out. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to trust the street. <laughs> like, that's insane. <laughs> um, we, I, we, we, we can't go around trusting the street. We should ask somebody, who is word on the street? What, what, do we have to move out? I don't, I don't know, because I've not actually been given uh, the source of this information. So that is proof surrogate. Um, and that is the last uh, example, or the last rhetorical device we're doing today. But I promised that there would be extra credit. So I'm going to type this out here. 
uh, just so you guys can add it to your notes. But this runs runs all semester, right up until uh, finals week. Um, we got to turn it in during finals week. So all semester for one point added to your final grade. This is significant. Uh, a point to your final grade can be the difference between a B plus and an A minus. It can be the difference between an A minus and an A. Um, right? If you had a 92, you'd have an A minus, but you can get this one extra point added to your grade and get bumped to an A. That's going to make a significant difference um, for your GPA. So, because the minuses do count differently. <laughs> Uh, nobody told me that during my first year of undergrad, and I was very upset. Um, so runs all semester for one point added to your final grade after everything's tallied. It probably won't show up on Canvas because I just add the point before I submit the final grade. Um, this extra credit for one point, you can't just keep turning them in. The maximum you can get. Um, find three examples of anything we um, in, in current affairs, media, um, pop culture, you can find me something on your Facebook. So the reason I bring this up now is because we have enough things that we've discussed in class um, that we should be able to start recognizing them out in the world. And I mention when I find things out in the world. So you find step one is find three examples of anything we discuss in class in either current affairs, you know, news, uh, the general media, it can be movies, it can be books. Um, so in a Word document, uh, either copy and paste uh, or you can screenshot screenshot or highlight that is just really not wanting to happen. Um, the relevant text. So don't just link me to a New York Times article that is six pages long and expect me to find uh, what it is that you're referring to. Um, identify what it is, right? So if you find a New York Times article that says it's right. Um, if you find a New York Times article that says it's obvious to anyone that Joe Biden is really tired, uh, I want you to highlight this for me. Give me the whole sentence. Give me some context. Um, Highlight that and then say, this is an example of proof, proof surrogate found in the New York Times. Why did I put that extra? Um, found in the New York Times. Please don't abbreviate like that. And then give me a link. To the article if it came from something like that. Um, if it didn't come from something on the internet, like let's say it came from a physical book you have, just give me the title of the book and the page number. Essentially just provide a very sloppy citation. Um, and then explain how it's an example of proof surrogate. Because rather than uh, offering evidence 
that Biden is tired or that anyone thinks he is tired. The New York, New York Times just says that it's Right. Um, so this is your one point extra credit opportunity. Why will that not bullet note? There we go. Um, so there's quite a few steps here uh, and you're going to need to do all of this three times. You can do it in the same word document, right? But when you look at it, it's really not much. Right. Uh, the, the body of text is, is relatively small. Uh, I want you to identify what it is that you've located. This will get really fun when we start doing fallacies because you can find them all over the place. Um, and then just essentially in a sentence or two, um, explain to me why it is an example of proof surrogate in this case. So that's, you know, times three. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, do that three times in a Word document, and you will get one point added to your final grade. I can't give you half a point for only doing two. Um, I'm sorry about that. There's just no possible... Oh, that looks like a laughing face. Um, there's no possible way to do that to your final grade. Uh, if you have any questions about this, or maybe you're not sure, you found something and you think it's proof surrogate, for example, um, just feel free to email me. Uh, I will not count just links. I will not count uh, massive paragraphs where nothing is identified or highlighted. Um, and I will not count submissions uh, without some kind of explanation uh, of why it is the item that you have identified. So it can literally be anything we discussed in class though. If you find an example of someone using excessively vague language, um, but it does need to be excessive, right? Uh, or, you know, relying on ambiguous language. If you encounter uh, flagrant generalities, these run wild. They are everywhere. Just in what we talked about today, uh, you know, most of these are examples that I have come across uh, this week. These are so common. So, and it's not just this class, it's anything we have talked about throughout the entire semester. So hopefully you guys will like that. Uh, I don't think you'll need any help, but it's also just a really fun side project that I always like to make sure uh, I offer to students. So thanks everyone, and uh, I will see you uh, next week.